Good afternoon and welcome to the third Harvard Law School Rappaport Forum. My name is Guy Charles. I'm the curr currently the Edward and Ellen Schwartzman Professor of Law at Duke Law School, uh, the co-founder of the Center on Law, Race, and Politics. Happy to say that in July, I will be joining the Harvard Law School faculty as the Charles J. Ogletree Jr. Professor of Law and as a director of the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon uh, and delighted to be serving as the moderator uh, for this forum. The HLS Rappaport Forum was launched last spring to promote full, open, and vigorous discussion, a respectful clash of ideas about critical and complicated issues facing our community, our nation, and indeed our world. It is made possible through a generous gift of the Rappaport Foundation, and it builds on the legacy of the Harvard Law School Forum, which Jerry Rappaport founded in the wake of the Second World War to provide aspiring lawyers with regular opportunities to engage with ideas and issues that are connected to the study of law and in a rapidly changing world. So it is my pleasure this afternoon to acknowledge and to thank Jerry and Phyllis Rappaport for nearly 75 years of support for Harvard Law School for their commitment to civic discourse and particularly for their generosity, which makes this event possible. Today's topic is, should Congress pass HR1? This is an omnibus statute that touches or bill that touches on questions of voting rights, campaign finance, electoral redistricting, government ethics, um, all questions that have come under renewed and intense scrutiny after the 2020 elections. Now, in the time that we have today, we won't be able to cover all of these questions, but just to give you a brief overview of this bill, which does a number of things. It recognizes that voting is a constitutional right. It shifts the burden from individuals to the government for the right to vote. It provides for automatic voter registration. Um, it centralizes a number of different aspects of election administration and voting practice. So the examples include provide for online registration in federal elections nationwide, making it harder for um, voters to be registered in more than one state. It standardizes voting practices by requiring each state to provide online voter registration, uh, providing early voting, same day registration, automatic voter registration, vote by mail. Uh, so it does a number of important and different things like providing funding to the states. And whatever one thinks of the merits of, as a policy measure, the bill also raises cons difficult constitutional questions as, as well as difficult um, policy questions. And we're very, very lucky to have two distinguished panelists to talk to us about the policy as well as the constitutional questions of the bill. Now, before introducing our speakers, I do want to make two very quick acknowledgments. First, I would be remiss if I did not take a second to acknowledge that this discussion is taking place against the backdrop of yesterday's verdict on the Chauvin trial. And for some members of this community, questions of democracy and racial equality are inseparable and very much linked. So it is important to um, acknowledge that fact. Second, I would also be remiss at not acknowledging how appropriate it is to have this discussion at Harvard. First, one of HR1's main sponsors is Representative John Sarbanes, who's a graduate of this law school. Second, Harvard has become the place for thinking about law and democracy. Most in this audience are familiar with the tremendous work of Professor Larry Lessig, uh, whose work in campaign finance and democratic representation is singularly in in impactful. Recently, Harvard has lured away Professor Nick Stephanopoulos, one of the brightest legal minds in law and democracy. And even more recently, this law school has announced the first clinic of its kind in the country, an election law clinic that will be directed by the superstar election law litigator, Ruth Greenwood. The role that law plays in furthering democratic freedom and representation is one of the defining issues of our time. So kudos to John Manning for assembling such, a, such, a great, such great people to make Harvard the central place as it should be for thinking about these issues. Now, I'd like to introduce our amazing speakers. Benjamin Ginsburg and Wendy Weisberg. Ben Ginsburg is a nationally known political advocate. His clients have included political parties, political campaigns, candidates, members of Congress, state legislatures, governors, corporations, trade associations. He represented four of the last, last six Republican presidential candidates. He has served as a national counsel of the Bush Cheney presidential campaigns in 2004. And in the 2000 election cycles played a central role in the 2000 Florida recount. Ben's representations range, range from across a variety of election law and regulatory issues, 
Uh, he served as a co-chair of the Bipartisan Presidential Commission on Election Administration. Could not have a better person to help us think through these questions. His counterpart, Wendy Weiser, directs the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, a nonpartisan think tank and public interest law center that works to revitalize, reform, and defend systems of democracy and justice. Her program focuses on voting rights and elections, money and politics, ethics, redistricting. She founded and directed the program's Voting Rights and Elections Project, directing litigation, research, and advocacy to enhance political participation um, and to prevent voter disenfranchisement across the country. She's authored a number of nationally recognized uh, publications and articles on voting rights reform and election reform, uh, litigated groundbreaking lawsuits. Again, we're very lucky to have Wendy and Ben. So I think we can look forward to a wonderful, lively, educational, and civil discussion. Okay, I'd like to start uh, first with Wendy and ask her to make the case for HR1 as broadly as she can on both the policy as well as the constitutional um, rights question. So Wendy, over to you. What's the case? So thank you so much, Guy. Um, thank you. Dean Manning and um, the Rappaport Forum. It's such a pleasure to join you and to talk about um, this important piece of legislation. And it's a pleasure to debate um, Ben Ginsburg um, on these um, critical issues. Um, so the For the People Act, it aims to markedly improve the workings of American democracy, to modernize it, to open it up, to restore public trust. It is coming at a time of real crisis for our democracy on multiple fronts. Um, just last year, and I'll start with voting, we had a, a, a remarkably um, successful election under the circumstances and under extremely difficult conditions, having the highest voter turnout since 1900, having an election that um, the federal government cybersecurity and infrastructure security agencies deemed the most secure in American history, and yet, a third of Americans were led to believe that um, the big lie, that this election was marred, it was stolen, um, it was marred by widespread fraud, um, and this culminated in an, a violent attack on our capital. It led to attempts to disenfranchise lots of voters, particularly targeting voters of color, um, in a real crisis moment for our democracy. Now, coming into the um, out of this election, across the country, we're seeing a fierce assault on the right to vote. Legislators are rushing a wave of new voting restrictions, trying to pass them. Um, we have been tracking this in, um, in now, and there are more than 360 bills moving in 47 states that would roll back access to voting. This would be the most significant cutback on voting rights since the Jim Crow era. And they are moving fast through the legislatures. Just yesterday, um, Montana um, passed um, one of some of their voting restrictions. The Arizona House voted out um, a significant bill um, rolling back voting rights there. And the proposals would all disproportionately affect and target voters of color if they are enacted. And we can talk about this. They would result in large scale disenfranchisement of eligible voters. And as more and more of the proponents are admitting, in many cases, that is precisely their purpose. And you know, we're hearing this quiet part being said out loud more and more. So this is um, one big threat facing our democracy on the voting front. And what the For the People Act aims to do is to actually, it would actually stop each and every one of these um, voting restrictions in their tracks by setting a national standard, a baseline set of voting rules that can't be manipulated, that everybody can rely on in federal elections. But voting's not our only crisis. Within a few months, we're gonna start the redistricting process to draw congressional district lines and there is a real risk that we're going to have unchecked state legislative majorities using this opportunity to gerrymander, to discriminate, and to deny communities a voice um, to, and in a significant way. We saw significant increase in extreme partisan and racial gerrymandering in the last decade. And we are heading into this decade with fewer legal protections against those abuses with high incentives and with lots of legislative bodies in a position to enact these abuses. Um, and so this is another crisis 
that is looming on the horizon that can um, impact representation for a decade. This legislation is also come, and for the People Act would actually address that. It would actually um, curb the um, possibility of partisan gerrymandering and create fairer redistricting process that will enable fairer redistricting for all communities, including communities of color who are often in the crosshairs of these redistricting um, fights. And the third crisis I'll just mention is we are now one decade after Citizens United ushered in a new era of extreme concentration of spending of money, big money dominating American politics. We have a role for big money like we haven't seen in the Gilded Age. This morning's New York Times reports on a um, report just issued by um, the um, bipartisan group Issue One, um, putting some figures on that concentration of power, uh, finding that um, it, since the Citizens United decision, 12 donors and their spouses, just 12, <laughs> actually have given $3.4 billion in federal elections, one in every $13 spent. The large donors, the donors that were um, over 100,000 or more have outspent in, in federal elections, the combined spending of the millions of small donors um, in the last couple of presidential elections. So this is another crisis that is making Americans feel disenfranchised, like their, their voices don't matter as much because we, we know that politicians listen to and policy follows um, the donors as much as, if not more than, the will of the voters. So these are converging crises and they, they have not been addressed. We have been had a stalemate in Congress for decades now. And we have now a unique opportunity to address these you know, tripartite and actually a third crisis with the crushing of ethical norms, crises facing American democracy. And that's a strength now of this legislation that we can actually have an opportunity to um, address all of them at once. These are, the, these are the things that are dampening the voices of millions of Americans. These are the things that are um, that are bringing our democracy to the brink of crisis. And what they would do is set a national standard across all these dimensions so that our electoral system should be same, have some baseline national standards regardless of where a citizen lives. And all of the provisions in HR1, and we'll go through them in detail, are built on successful policies that have been in place at national, state, and local levels across the country. Every single one of them has been um, honed by election officials over the years, has been put in place or has garnered bipartisan support at the state and local level and is widely supported by the American public regardless, regardless of partisan political persuasion. So here's a real opportunity to make a difference. And uh, the, so the broad case for the constitutionality is these are problems that only Congress can solve. These are abuses going on at the state level. And in fact, it was the constitution's vision that it was precisely the appropriate role for the federal government um, in the elections clause to give Congress the authority to regulate elections in the case of uh, federal elections in the case of abuses at the state level. Um, they, the Congress um, was given a, what has been recognized by the Supreme Court as an extraordinarily broad power a power that Justice Scalia said could be to write an entire congressional elections code. It's a power that's been used to um, justify sweeping election legislation, money in politics legislation, redistricting legislation in the past. And it's a power that is strong enough to encompass um, uh, all of the provisions um, of HR 1 or, and S1. And so I'll, with that, I'll... Uh, Okay, so then I'm going to turn it over to you. As I understand the case for from Wendy, um, three particular uh, purposes to promote political participation in the voting rights context: the move by the states um, to undermine voting rights, the case for uniformity and nationalization, and the camp in the redistricting context: um, the importance of uniformity. And in the context of campaign finance, the uh, role that big money plays, we're gonna leave aside the ethics questions for a moment, but the role that big money plays in minimizing the voice of the people. And then on the constitutional question that Congress has the power broadly under the election clause 
to address what one could think of as the collective action problem. So now I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, what's your response? What are your thoughts? Well, thank you, Guy, and thank you very much for uh, having me here in the Rappaport Forum and to Dean Manning and uh, uh, you and the faculty for, uh, for having us here. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, Wendy, uh, with whom I have certainly discussed these issues uh, over the past years a, a great deal. And uh, I know that she and the Brennan Center uh, have well thought out positions that they uh, advocate for passionately. So I look forward to um, this discussion. Um, Guy, I would frame this up in terms of uh, about three starting points, really. Uh, the first that uh, really permeates so much of this is the historic polarization in the country right now. Uh, we are divided as never before. It's true in election statistics. It's true in attitudes in communities and attitudes in families even. Uh, and, and people feel very passionately about this subject. Wendy's reference to the big lie as a major contributing factor to it, I think is, is absolutely correct. Um, but the problem is, is that the, the different poles of the country are not talking to each other and feel so passionately about their view that they're denigrating the other side's view and in fact, often denigrating the people who hold the other views. That is a dangerous place for the democracy to be. We have to look at HR1 and the voting issues in the states in that context. Um, number, the second context is what we've been reading uh, more about than HR1, and that's the voting bills that Republicans are pushing in the states. Um, a little bit of a personal disclaimer here, while a lifelong Republican, um, I don't agree with many of the things that, um, that the Republican Party is doing now in the voting area. That's certainly true amongst uh, much of the legislation in the states. And while I don't agree with it, I think my role here today is to explain it as best as possible, um, because I do think that that's an important part in being able to, to solve all these um, problems we're, we're talking about. And there are individual provisions in both the state laws that, re that are reflected in HR 1 that, um, that we can talk about. But let me say what's most upsetting to me about the Republican actions in the states is that they do seem aimed at an electoral result, that the, the emerging demographic changes in the country uh, make Republicans fear for the electoral results in the future and are aimed at specific groups which Republicans think will not vote for them in the future. And that is the wrong reason to pass laws, that results-driven uh, legislation in this area is always bad. And if there are political outcomes to make up for either past or perceived future uh, voting deficiencies, that is precisely the wrong reason to um, pass legislation. The third major point I'd make is that there are 30, 35, 40% of the population that don't believe in our election results. And uh, whether, whether that is attributable to a big lie or not, that is a real problem. Remember that the peaceful transfer of power that undergirds our entire process is really based on the losing parties accepting the results. And that 30 to 35% that don't believe in election results, that thinks our process is fraudulent, is a real problem that has to be addressed and can't, the, the position just can't be denigrated by saying, well, they don't know what they're talking about because that is a large percentage of people who just don't believe in an essential strength of, um, of, of our system. And so I think all those uh, three things need to be taken into account when discussing HR1 and the state uh, election bills. Um, as for HR1 itself, it is an 800 page bill more or less. And there are good provisions in that bill that should be the subject of bipartisan agreement. Um, 
that it is a bill that uh, while it may have started out as reform with all the best intentions, has got some problems because it reads and there are enough provisions in it that those good intentions got hijacked by the Democrats wily political operatives who are trying to put in provisions to gain a democratic electoral uh, advantage in the future. I, I, I don't wanna draw a false equivalency between the Republican voting rights bills because they do go towards the most fundamental of all rights, the right to vote. And what's in HR1, uh, I put much more in the context of the political animal generally behaving badly in order to try and get um, electoral gains. And here's the reality of what Republicans see when they look at HR1. Uh, Democrats did not meet their expectations in the past election, uh, in the past in 2020, for winning results. There are states in the South and West. Uh, which because of their policies uh, on various issues, uh, they can't win. Uh, in fact, uh, Democrats believe they get between 52 and 55 uh, Senate seats. They're 50 uh, in the House. Instead of gaining 15 to 20 seats, they lost 13 seats. It's the narrowest margin uh, since World War II in a House of Representatives. Democrats spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to win state legislative chambers uh, in order to be able to draw their maps in redistricting. Uh, in fact, Democrats failed to flip any chamber, lost 135 seats overall. And so much of what in HR1, Republicans see as an attempt to change the rules of the game because they can't win the game. In other words, if we were to start um, uh, declaring the winner in football games based on the number of yards gained as opposed to the final score, that would be the equivalent of a, nu of a number of uh, provisions. And just to give you a few examples to tee them up for the more uh, specific discussions we'll have, um, I mentioned the Democrats had tried very, very hard to flip legislative chambers in 2020 and failed. Well, all of a sudden, uh, Democrats in Congress are wildly in favor of redistricting commissions, which would take the power to draw maps away from state legislatures and give them to commissions, which at best have a, um, a debatable track record in terms of coming up with fair maps. Uh, I mentioned that the Democrats had failed to reach their goals of winning uh, Senate seats. In fact, it's a 50-50 Senate right now. So the Democrats' solution in HR1 is to change the makeup of the Senate and to add four Senate seats from uh, two, two uh, territories that would lean Democratic, tilting the rules of the game. Um, taxpayer funding for federal campaigns is one of the finance position uh, I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, providing uh, uh, taxpayer dollars for politicians at this particular time in our economic history seems to be a strange but long held democratic goal. It concentrates on small dollar donations. Uh, we should talk about the policies uh, of that just because of the messaging that it takes to be a successful small dollar fundraiser and probably not the intent of the law to give $20 million or so per quarter to some of the loudest voices against certifying the election results. But based on first quarter fundraising uh, statistics, it's the Ted Cruz's and the Josh Hollies and the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the, and the Matt Gates who would most benefit from that pro provision. There are provisions to change the FEC into a far more partisan entity than it is now. We can talk about dysfunction versus partisanship as virtues uh, in, the, in the goal. Uh, on a constitutional level, the national rules for federal elections, the concept of one size fits all, will certainly run into uh, objections uh, from Republicans. Some of the provisions on providing barriers to issue ads will insulate incumbents from criticism of their positions on issues. And so I think, uh, I think we have a lot to talk about in the constitutional and the policy realm. 
on. Great. Right. So let me start with this. I have two in, uh, initial questions, one for Wendy and one for Ben. And if you keep your answers a bit short and then we can all engage with one another. So first for you, Wendy, um, I thought uh, Ben's point about the current polarization um, and, and the ideal, both polarization and the ideological divide in this country uh, over the extent of voting and political participation or even redistricting or money in politics. Um, and the fact that um, there may be a significant percentage of the population who do not trust our election processes, um, right? That those are, and that some, an omnibus bill like HR1 for the People Act um, will either contribute to that polarization and deepen it or, and or contribute to the distrust um, and deepen and deepen that. So, um, right, so that's, that's an initial objection on the basis of sort of the current political realities and its interaction with uh, the policy proposal. What, what is your response to uh, that argument? That, look, we just, we have two different ways of thinking about this problem. It's ideological, it's partisan, and it's polarized. Uh, and we can't simply ram it down the throat of the American public when they're not unified on how to think about voting, political participation, redistricting, or campaign finance as, 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 as examples. So I agree with them that one of our most significant challenges facing our democracy is the extent of our polarization. Um, I think that um, I, I can make an argument for how the reforms in HR1 would reduce that polarization over time, but you know, speaking in the short time frame, I, I don't think that passing HR1 would increase or reduce the polarization. I think it is independent of the election rules that are out there. And I think that research, political science research has shown that when election reforms are passed um, in different states, uh, the, there's been um, uh, that it doesn't actually increase or decrease the confidence in election outcomes or elections that often is much more tied to whether or not you're a candidate or party won elections. So I think the policy question and the public perception question are a, a little bit distinct there. Um, I would, um, I, I don't think that it's a reasonable position to take, and I'm, I'm not ascribing this position to Ben Ginsburg, but I, I don't think it would be a, a reasonable objection to HR1 to say that there is a significant portion of the population that wants to restrict access to voting and subtract voters from the electorate because they you know, don't like what potential election outcomes that would bring. That is inconsistent with our constitutional design, with our country's principles, and I, I, I guess I would take the position that even if there is a partisan divide on that issue, which I, I, I don't think is true actually when you get to the electorate level, though it, it, in some places at, at, at the extremes it is, um, that there's a principled um, need to actually hold firm on the need to protect the right to vote and, it, and to the need to ensure that, that that's a baseline premise of our system that everybody should be able to participate um, without significant burden um, in a way that you know, ensures the integrity of the election outcome, that that um, unnecessary burdens are not appropriate. Um, you know, similarly, you know, in the redistricting process, despite the fact that partisans, I don't think it's the public, um, might want to be able to manipulate the process for their advantage um, and to rig the lines so that they can lock in control over time. I don't think as a principled matter, we should accept that as, as a legitimate goal and allow for those tools to persist. We should look for a neutral set of tools where everybody has an even playing field and an equal chance to persuade voters and to be held accountable by voters. So I guess that's sort of my, my argument is that these are matters of core principle and not debatable matters that I think that these um, that HR1 is trying to address. On the issue of the particular reforms in there, when you look at the public polling, which I'm not sure that that's 
the best way to assess legislation, but if we're talking about the polarization and how people are going to react to it, the public polling is very strongly in favor of each and every one of these major reforms in a bipartisan way. Um, and and in most of them actually get a majority of Republicans too. Some don't, some it's a little bit less than a majority of Republicans and certainly of independents as well. But so there's a, a, a deep well of support in principle for the kinds of reform, automatic voter registration, um, you know, restricting dark money in elections, um, ending partisan gerrymandering, you know, uh, even um, th these things generate broad, broad bipartisan support among the public. And so it is not clear to me that they will lead to any additional polarization. There is a fact that our Congress is polarized and if it gets passed on party lines, it will be, there will, it will be spun <laughs> as a partisan takeover. And if it doesn't pass, it will be spun as a partisan effort to, you know, um, our democracy. And either way, we will continue to be in this polarized discussion, but that's the discussion we're in right now. Thank you, Wendy. Ben, I'll give you a chance to respond, but I, but I want to press you on one of the points, that, <clears throat> too, that you made on um, D.C. and Puerto Rico, um, which um, you characterize as, in some senses, a gerrymandering of the Senate, which would be another way of thinking about it. Um, and, and I found that striking in part because it's hard for me to think about um, in the 21st century of American citizens who um, are, have the full rights of being American citizens, but don't have core fundamental rights of participation. And, um, and that seems to be to me to be inconsistent with the rest of your comments. I want to, I'll come back in a second to your point about campaign finance reform, because I think you, I think you make a very good point there on small donors, and I'd like to hear how Wendy responds to the policy argument in particular, and then later on we can think about the constitutional questions. All right, so I think, I think that is, um, that's definitely worth unpacking, but I was a bit curious about the DC and Puerto Rico that, that strikes me as inconsistent with the rest of the principles that you're espousing. Um, so that is a really difficult issue, um, especially I say that as a resident of the District of Columbia, so that that um, I have somewhat chafed under this um, this status for a while. But the reality is, is that statehood bills for D.C. and Puerto Rico have been proposed for a long, long time. There have been other instances where Democrats had complete control of the Congress and did not feel the need to put forward DC and Puerto Rico on statehood. It comes now at this time of polarization in a manner that would in fact gerrymander the US Senate. And if you're talking about the great problems in the country as a whole of our polarization, then you have to consider the real world political realities of what that would mean. And the sudden embrace of statehood for those entities, um, if it is designed to gain a political advantage for Democrats, will have deleterious effects throughout the society. So uh, that's why I think that they will be perceived as rep by Republicans as particularly polarizing uh, uh, measures. If I could just add one just minor um, clarification about what the For the People Act has in it. While it has findings approving of um, the statehood for DC and Puerto Rico, it doesn't actually have operative provisions. Like those are actually separate legislation. There are, it also has findings um, approving of and calling for the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and of the Native American Voting Rights Act, also other critical provisions that I think are um, uh, also important um, to address the crisis that we're in right now, especially in the voting rights, those operative provisions are not in HR1, they're just the findings. So, so. Gee, let, me, let, me make a, let me make a broad point about HR1 in, in general and um, part of why it's becoming such a flashpoint. So uh, Wendy can talk about really meritorious provisions in HR1 and I'm going to agree with her 
on a whole bunch of them. But it again, it is taking the meritorious positions, the ones that can get bipartisan agreement, but including in the overall bill, the overtly partisan ones and saying you've got to pass this one big sprawling 800 page bill that will only go through on a party line vote if it goes through at all, um, as opposed to uh, doing what could be done if, if the real pure goal was enacting the meritorious provisions, which would be to break it up, to consider the bill on regular order, uh, and to deal with the individual um, provisions. And I hope we get a chance to talk about a number of the provisions in the bill, and even in some of the state voting bills that uh, would improve elections in voting, uh, participation in the country, take down barriers to voting, but which are not gonna get uh, an adequate hearing, a fair hearing, unless it's broken down. Because if it's just this one big package, uh, there are enough little poison pills in it that, um, that it becomes a polarizing part when individual provisions could be the source of bipartisan agreement. So, so Wendy, let's talk about that. And, and this criticism is not is being offered across the ideological divide. That is not just by um, um, Republicans or right of center people, but, 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 but also by some left of center academics and activists, uh, which is that, that an omnibus um, bill is just a bad idea. It combines together a bunch of stuff, whether it's ethics, campaign finance, redistricting, voting rights stuff that really shouldn't be combined together, that should be given different thought and hearing, and that there's the possibility of getting some of these reforms through, perhaps even in a bipartisan way, if it weren't being rammed together as a package. Um, and so that, that in and of itself is part of the objection, including perhaps some uh, arguments as to some of the specifics on either policy grounds, which we can come to back in, in a moment, as well as on public uh, on constitutional grounds. So how do you think about what seems to be an objection offered by a broad range of people to the omnibus package itself? So, um... I want to first start small by, um, I, I, I'm thrilled that um, Ben Ginsburg believes and, and actually supports a number of the provisions of the bill and believes that there are major portions that could achieve bipartisan support um, in the Congress. Our experience of working on this for a long time and trying to accomplish that in each of the individual provisions over time is is um, you know I, I do not um, believe that that at this point is possible. That the that the parties have become very polarized, especially on the issue of voting rights. That has been like where there's been no potential for any movement. And uh, the best case in point there is the um, Voting Rights Act restoration, which had traditionally been wildly bipartisan back in 2006. The reauthorization passed unanimously in the Senate and all near unanimously in the House was signed into law by George W. Bush, but it, efforts to restore it since the Supreme Court gutted its core provision have struggled to obtain even one Republican co-sponsor. It has been, you know, this it has been clearly divided on partisan lines, something that something that has previously not even been controversial. So I think we're in a different world and um, to what can achieve um, bipartisan support on the voting side. Um, and now I wanna sort of flip the, um, the idea that the size or the, the fact that it brings together four major areas is a weakness of the bill because I believe that that is a strength of the bill. It's part of what is giving it its momentum um, and its broad based um, support because these are all reforms and areas, as I mentioned, that I, I think we could all acknowledge there are real challenges right now in each of these areas in American democracy and something's going wrong. Um, and, you know, in different stakeholders, groups of stakeholders care about one or more of those areas more than others. 
Um, and what we have right now is a broad coalition um, at, of, of people from different backgrounds and with different focuses that all actually support and are pushing around one package of reforms instead of different slices looking at different pieces and none of them getting enough momentum politically to get on the table. So I do think that that's politically a strength. And just as a policy matter, we, we have, as I mentioned, that there's a, I think in all of these areas, we're at a crisis point and it has been so long since Congress has been able to legislate on any of these areas that the problems have compounded. So we, and we are heading into the, the point of where, you know, it, and some people think that you know the crisis might be existential, and where where people are storming the Capitol, um, where people aren't believing in the system anymore. We we can't wait for some mythical coming together in this polarized time. Wendy, so that's me, sort of the political response. Let me ask you, and then I'll turn to Ben. But let me just ask you about the constitutionality of um, for the People Act. Um, because the, you know the different provisions, the different areas, voting rights, campaign finance, redistricting, presidential elections versus federal elections, um, mm -hmm. seem to raise different constitutional questions. So yes, there yeah. the main provisions of HR one can seem to fall under Article one, Section four, times, cities, places, and manners of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but Congress may at any time by law uh, make or alter such regulations. Um, but what about say the provisions dealing with presidential elections or what about the provisions on redistricting or what about the provisions on campaign finance reform? So it seems that there is a constitutional question here and particularly given the makeup of the current court that that's a court that's likely to focus on those constitutional questions. So we'll start with you and then I'll turn to Ben and then we'll turn to questions from the from the from our listeners. So each of the provisions of HR1 are designed to be uh, and are constitutional under existing precedents of the court. Um, and so I'll, I'll give a broad sketch of that, um, but you know that doesn't answer the question as to whether or not a current court or a future court might change or its interpretation of the Constitution. The Roberts Court has been very unfriendly um, to democracy, to voting rights, to campaign finance laws, um, and to um, attempts to make redistricting more fair. And we've seen a you know, twenty years of decisions that have been undermining our democracy in each of those areas. And so I, I understand the objection that what's to stop them from doing more, but this is one area where the Roberts Court and even the most conservative justices have been very emphatic that Congress's power to regulate elections, federal elections is extremely broad. And so if we take in the redistricting context, um, the Supreme Court, um, it, just a couple of years ago, decided that um, Congress, uh, that, that federal courts um, can't be in the business of policing partisan gerrymandering, even though it violates core constitutional principles. And one of the bases for its decisions was that Congress can fix this. The Constitution has a remedy. This is not, it's not the courts, but it's Congress. Congress can um, address partisan gerrymandering. And, and in fact, Justice Roberts in that decision expressly called out the For the People Act as pending legislation that would um, do just that, that would address um, the, the problem that it said that the courts were powerless to address, that that was the constitutional role of Congress. That is consistent, and, and in fact, the role, and I'm happy to go at, on at length about the, um, this was discussed at the framing, um, of the Constitution, Madison was very emphatic that um, Congress needed powers under the election clause to prevent the states from engaging in vote suppression and from manipulating voting rules in order to favor, you know, which candidates they preferred or, or to entrench themselves in power. Um, and so this is precisely what it was intended to do. What about presidential? We start with presidential elections. I'm sorry. 
What so, about presidential elections? So the, the elections clause um, expressly refers to the um, federal power over um, congressional elections, the electors clause, which on its face is narrower um, relating to presidential uh, presidential elections doesn't have the same language of time place and Congress making or altering the time place or manner of conducting those elections. It just it, it refers to the time. Of course, it was at, drafted at a time when um, the populace, populace wasn't directly electing presidential electors. But since then, the courts have uniformly interpreted the scope of the and, and, and the Supreme Court has uh, of the Congress's power under the electors clause as coextensive with that under the elections clause. So there's a, 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 a long string of decisions doing that. Under that, it has upheld a whole range of federal regulations, both on the voting side and on the campaign finance side, regulating both congressional and presidential elections without giving much um, attention to the difference in that authorizing language. Um, and so it's possible that that will change over time, but it also is more workable that way. It would be a system, a, a, a strange system for the constitution to set up for when states are um, organizing elections and holding presidential and congressional elections at the same time, in the same places and at the same, in the same manner, to have a different set of rules that apply to both. That would, that would be uh, so. Ben, do you think that HR1 raises constitutional and federalism problems? Um, and where do you think the divides are? So is it on presidential versus um, other federal elections? Is it um, substantive, campaign finance, redistricting, et cetera? So what, what are the constitutional questions that you think are likely to come up? Well, I think all of the above, uh, Guy. Just, just, just to make the broad point, I, I appreciate that um, uh, Wendy has uh, frustrations with the Supreme Court rulings of the last um, 20, really probably 30 and 40 years uh, in this area. Uh, but after all, elections do have consequences. And so the vote of the people has put certain people in power and they get to nominate the uh, the justices. And so Wendy referred to all the polling information that she says supports her law, but you know, Supreme Court justices are uh, uh, confirmed by the people who are actually elected in elections. So in, in, in a broad point, um, those decisions are the precedent to be dealt with and provide a pretty good indication of how uh, the Supreme Court certainly in its current uh, makeup would, um, would look at all of this. Uh, and there will be different constitutional challenges brought to different provisions of the law. And if you wanted, if this law does actually get jammed through uh, the way the Senate would, I think, have to do it now, um, what, what, you'll, what you'll, I think McCain-Feingold and litigation around McCain-Feingold will be a perfect example of it. Whereas the as-applied challenges are broad, the law gets reduced and reduced and reduced because the concept of what is constitutional by um, people who have put up a number of these provisions is markedly different from what the courts is. Um, you raise one of the really interesting questions about the use of the elections clause to justify this uh, and whether that would apply to any elections other than congressional elections. Because it is clear that state legislatures still do have the power to, um, to create the rules for their elections. And should this bill uh, get jammed through by the Democratic Congress, I think you would see a number of states uh, first of all, draft their own rules, but, but more likely start to follow the model that's already used in the five states uh, that have off-year elections. And you would see lots of um, states under Republican control move their elections to the odd number of years and sort of the New Jersey, uh, Virginia model. Um, 
In terms of the number of the, the campaign finance uh, provisions, all the usual First Amendment um, arguments will be made. And for the voting and election administration uh, sections, which you discussed about uh, uh, Article 2, Section 1, which talks about presidential elections having no role for Congress. That's all deferred to the state legislatures. So I think if passed, the textualists on the Supreme Court, which as I counted is still a majority, would, uh, would probably have some real difficulties with presidential elections, uh, uh, obviously falling under uh, what would be done with congressional elections. Okay, so let's go to the questions from our audience. So some of you have been asking great questions, keep them coming. In fact, we've already covered the first one, which was on the constitutionality. So somebody anticipated um, and remembered their constitutional law class um, at Harvard, so which taught them well. All right, so here's one question. Um, there are a couple ways of thinking about voting reform. And for the most part, race has been through the Voting Rights Act, the mechanism for thinking about voting reform. Um, HR1, though, you know, Wendy, as you said, yes, it, it nods to the John Lewis Act. That, that seems to be much more of a, it's, it's not substantive, it's, it's, it's basically political, uh, but has basically taken partisanship and ideology and universality as the basis for regulation. Um, does that matter both from a policy perspective, right? So does it matter whether, say, the state laws that are, that are being passed across the country are motivated by race or partisanship? Does it matter for HR1, that HR1, unlike the VRA, doesn't seem to be really motivated by, by dealing with racial discrimination, but, but seems to be motivated by a, a universal consideration of political participation? Um, how do you both think about the policy questions as well as you think about the constitutional questions that's from one, from one of, of our participants? So I'll start with the both and. I, I did wanna just add a caveat first is that I, I haven't expressly responded to Ben's claim that there are provisions that are partisan in either their intent or effect. And I wanna just say emphatically, I disagree agree with that and the provisions he was talking about, the small donor public financing, the redistricting provisions, the FEC reform. And I don't think anybody would think that you would agree with them. I just wanted to be very clear that those, um, and we could talk about there, that not only is there real evidence that there is, um, would not be any partisan effect of that, but they actually do have bipartisan support and have been adopted with bipartisan support in states and um, elsewhere, but so putting, Aside that. But while you're there, Wendy, just before you, you answer the, the other question, but while you're there, what about Ben's point, though, that the small donor requirements would actually increase polarization, would, would go to the extremes, um, the extreme can, candidates who are at the extremes of their, of their party. So aren't you worried about um, that aspect of it? And, and also feel free, please, mm -hmm. to continue on with the question. So the, the re, I, there's a couple of reasons why that's not something I'm worried about. So the, the first reason is, you know, that that's a problem under our existing system and with the existing base of donors, you know, that we have people who are motivated by either, um, and this is, um, we know that small donors and large donors, there's there all the, most of the studies out there, the vast majority of them show that small donors are no more polarizing or polarized than large donors. And it is true that some portion of them are motivated by supporting extremes. And in fact, actually much more of them are actually motivated by um, winning races, competitive races. And that's where you see a lot of the small donors being mobilized is around close competitive races. So you actually end up seeing a lot more of it supporting moderate candidates as opposed to extreme candidates. But more broadly, in practice, places that have had these small donor matching systems have not experienced this kind of polarization. You know, we've had many years and maybe the country wasn't as polarized, but there were many years under the presidential public financing system. You know, the, there, this did not lead to polarization. It allowed Ronald Reagan to win with a landslide in 1984 without hosting a single fundraiser. I mean, that was a system that was used by Republicans and Democrats alike. And in New York City and Los Angeles and other places that actually have similar matching systems, we don't see that effect. 
of polarization. Because what the real effect is, it is it changes behavior, fundraising behavior and donor behavior. More people, it increases who participates because your dollars actually matter more. And it increases, it, it, what it changes candidates instead of dialing for large donors, which are maxed out at a much lower rate, actually spend much more time campaigning in their districts. And you see a much greater proportion of their money comes from their own constituents in their districts and a much more diverse set of people are contributing. So that's the actual effect in practice. And so that's why, that's a, so yes, there will still be some polarized candidates and there will still be people who are um, uh, drawn towards them. And this system will reward whatever vote, whoever voters support in that way. But it is a system that I think will actually move in a different direction away from this kind of just extreme polarization of the existing um, donor base towards a more um, community and candidate um, uh, constituent focused politics. Could, could I address that before we move on, Guy? Because I think it's a I think it's a really important point. I mean, uh, first of all, what's envisioned in HR one is not similar to what's in New York City or Los Angeles, because those systems uh, provide the match only for residents of those jurisdictions. HR one, in fact, allows uh, uh, any donor from any part in the country to give to any individual candidate, which is totally different. And in fact, if someone was going to game the system, they would give $200 to 435 different candidates, get the six to one match for, um, for each one. And so the, the whole character of, of the HR1 concept of, of matching funds, even if you agree with matching funds, is, uh, I think, fatally flawed. Um, it does indeed polarize the messages and the political science research is just crystal clear that the candidates who are most successful raising money are the ones on the polar extremes and not the ones with sort of let's all get together and compromise. But in campaign finance, I think one area of bipartisan agreement is that the current system isn't working. And what mystifies me about HR1 as an overall uh, reform bill in campaign finance is that it seems to rest on the notion of past performance is not an indicator of future results. Because honestly, this concept of small donors being virtuous and um, sort of trying to starve political party committees has led to the exact opposite effect of what, they're, of what the system is trying to get, what, what he's advocating for. And in fact, uh, she's right, large dollars do predominate the system now and individual donors do. And it forces all candidates to spend too much time raising money instead of like talking to their peers and maybe legislating. So uh, I, honestly, if this was a great reform bill instead of a democratic bill, it would have re been rethinking the basic notions that have not worked in any way, shape, manner, or form since 1976. Okay, so we have 15 minutes. I've got to get through as many questions from the audience as possible. So let me try. Um, I'll, I'll bundle Can I answer that together. question? And, and I will bundle them together uh, for, for you all, and you all are amazing, agentic people, so you could answer however, when, whatever, whatever, you can answer whatever <laughs> question you think I'm asking, whether I'm asking it or not. All right, so starting with you, Ben, a uh, question that has come up a number of times from many members of our audience is, uh, the question is whether you can identify specific parts of HR1 that Republicans might be able to support or that you, and that you support. For you, Wendy, one question that has come up is um, the absence of support for third parties on HR1 and um, with objections from folks who would like to um, have greater voice um, from third parties and, and they're worried about what HR1 is gonna do for third parties. So if you would, um, st we'll start with you first, Ben, and then we'll go to you, Wendy, and then hopefully we get another couple set of questions in there before we end at, at 110. Uh, I think the uh, election administration voting rights sections, which I sort of look at as interchangeably, and I think probably Wendy um, does too, are the areas where you might well uh, be able to get um, to get some bipartisan report, uh, support. 
Uh, I do think that there are ways to uh, reduce barriers to voting that actually have dealt with in the proper context would work. Uh, I think the place that you would start is look to, to sort of an appearance standard for election administration. We regulate everything in campaign finance uh, on corruption or the appearance of corruption. There aren't any real corruption cases. You take that principle to the election administration, you would have an appearance of public confidence standards, things that are in the law uh, that uh, to get people to agree that the elections were fair. Look what Governor Ducey uh, in Arizona and Governor Kemp in Georgia said to Donald Trump about why their elections were fair. And that would form the framework of it. So there are provisions of voter ID that I suspect uh, could be melded into an acceptable standard. Uh, for absentee ballots, the validation process. Signatures are an ugly thing these days. Nobody writes the same way twice. They don't teach penmanship in, in, uh, to anybody uh, below the age of 30. Signatures aren't right, but there are various metrics uh, that could be used. Uh, the, uh, the deadlines on when absentee ballots are received in return for extending early voting, uh, mail in early voting options with both Republicans and Democrats have used, online registration provisions, notice and cure provisions, the pre processing of absentee ballots before election day, and a, a, a variety of, um, of other reforms forms in that area, I think are, uh, I think are quite reachable. And there's probably a way to deal with the pre-clearance uh, standard as well, as long as it's not a return to the old days, uh, of what the mm -hmm. Supreme Court threw out in Shelby County. Thank you, Ben. Wendy, what about third parties? Does HR1 contain lower okay. barriers or make it harder? So I, um, I, I wanted to answer the earlier question, because I think it was a very important question about, you know, the whether or not to tackle voting rights from an anti-discrimination perspective or from a national standards perspective. And my answer is both. I think it is critical. I, I mean, as we've all been saying, what we're seeing across the country now and the big threat, the rollback of voting rights is racially targeted. It is racially motivated and its impact is racially discriminatory. And so, race discrimination is um, a critical need to address. And the way we've traditionally dealt with it is through the Voting Rights Act, which was the most successful piece of civil rights legislation in our history. And we need to restore the strength of that so that we can better combat discrimination. But that's not enough. And we still saw, and you know, the, with the preclearance formula, we're gonna have um, you know, some key, um, States and jurisdictions that are repeat offenders are going to be covered and their legislation would be reviewed for discrimination before it goes into effect, but the vast majority of the country would not have that impact. There are, there are certain practices that there would be preclearance from and the updated one nationally, but by and large, when the Voting Rights Act was in effect before the Shelby County decision, we also had a wave of voting restrictions not as significant as what we're seeing right now, but that passed into law. And many of them passed the hurdle of the Voting Rights Act because it's hard to prove discrimination and because it also could take years to go into effect. What the provisions in here um, in the For the People Act do by creating this national standard is it takes certain kinds of tools of election administration that can be manipulated for discriminatory results um, to target and boot out certain groups of voters, um, you know, outcome determinative, but uh, on, in a racially discriminatory way and takes that off the playing field of what can be manipulated. You can't reduce access to voter registration because everybody has this baseline access to voter registration. So there's less that you can do to actually accomplish discriminatory outcomes because every American has a certain floor, a federal floor that they can rely on. And so I think both tactics are necessary, especially in the time that we're in. And, and, and then there's of course the non, 
discrimination based case for these these are actually good reforms they lead to better election administration they're working well in the states they're leading to better outcomes in all the places that have them in place like they actually now have a track record and so so it, it attacks both okay let me um throw two other questions at um both of you i will start with you wendy and then the second question will be for you ben uh, the first question actually follows from what you were saying, and it's about the Georgia voter ID law, and I think is related to the idea that the states are engaged in racial discrimination. And the are the the questioner asks, look, the voter the Georgia voter ID law basically asks for a voter ID, lasts four digits of the social security, driver's license, any government issued ID, passport, utility bill, paycheck, government check stub, and if you don't have any of those you can simply get a free government ID. And part of the question is, what's wrong, what's unconstitutional with these types of um, state um, requirements? And it, it, they don't seem to be unconstitutional nor particularly targeted. Are they really imposing um, illegitimate burdens on voters? Uh, and then for you, Ben, the question, you, you said earlier that um, uh, voting rights for DC and Puerto Rico are political and the question is look um aren't a, a admission of any new state always political is that is that really an objection so let's start there um let's see if we could do that in five minutes and then maybe we get another round of questions in so the voter id laws are um there there are voter id laws and voter id laws and the, there isn't a broad opposition to voter id in general the broad range of ids that you have just outlined are actually required by federal law for every um, every new voter to be provided when they um, before they vote the first time. What has been causing the objections are the particulars of the laws that are being pushed and how restrictive the voter ID laws are. They are reducing the numbers of IDs that are acceptable and excluding IDs that many citizens of those states have, and they are reducing options for people who don't have those IDs to find another path to identify themselves, um, prove they are who they say they are, and still vote a ballot that will count. And so if we take, um, yeah, actually, Georgia was an interesting case because Georgia actually passed um, the first or the second strict voter ID law in the country limiting the forms of ID to a narrow list of government issued photo IDs. Um, and at the same time, it didn't provide for free IDs initially when it was put into place. And there were, and it also had at the same time increased the price of obtaining driver's licenses or non-drivers issued state IDs. That was challenged um, constitutionally um, about a decade ago and it prompted Georgia back and forth <laughs> in uh, multiple um, uh, iterations to amend its law and amend its ID requirements so that more people had access so that it was no longer gonna cost money until it landed somewhere that the court found was acceptable. The fights over voter IDs are all in their particulars, not the concept in general. And what the For the People Act would do, it doesn't actually ban voter ID laws. It, it accepts that states will have different voter ID laws and it doesn't change the federal requirement that it applies to everybody. What it does say is if you do have a strict um, ID law, you have to have a process, a separate process for voters to be able, who don't have those IDs, to be able to cast a ballot count and to be able to swear to their identity before a state official. And, um, and, and that path needs to exist. So, so that both can coexist, a voter ID requirement and a path for those voters who don't have those limited forms of ID to still cast a ballot that will count. And that's 10% of voters in, in many places. In some places it's 3%, but that's a significant number. Uh, Guy, before I get to DC, um, Wendy brought up uh, the popularity of the provisions on campaign finance as a reason to uh, to pass the law, let's just say that the polling on voter ID and people in favor of voter ID is even greater. So if we're gonna look at the popular will, we should, um, we should uh, remember that. Um, and also one of the frustrating things about this debate that we're having now is that a number of the, the sort of reasons that Republicans and Democrats are on each side got exploded in this past election. 
One was the Democrats did just fine in states with some of the strictest voter ID laws. And uh, Republicans actually did very well, especially down ballot in high turnout elections. So that whether the long-term Republican desire to put up barriers to some people voting is justified, got belied by the election results. Um, moving on to DC and whether it's political, um, my point was not whether it should be political or not. The point was that in 2021, given the polarization and the other overriding factors, it is political right now. And it's always going to be perceived as political as long as we're this polarized and as long as there's not regular order on a bill and it may just get um, jammed through on a party line vote. So the ideal of what it should be is different from the reality of, uh, of where it is in 2021. Allow me then to, to then um, give you all the last word um, in less than 30 seconds on what you would like to leave people with, um, our wonderful audience, on For the People Act. I will start with you, Wendy, and then you will have the last word, and then I will close. Well, I, I guess I'll start back to first principles. Um, which is, I, I think that the, the politics are um, obviously um, uh, in play here, but what the For the People Act is reforms that have been pushed and desired for many years and have been successfully put in place by both Democrats and Republicans in states and localities across the country. So they are neutral in their conception. You know, at a particular moment, whoever holds powers, whoever holds the reins in line drawing might find um, a provision that bans partisan gerrymandering or, or requires um, transparency or an enhanced judicial remedy for gerrymandering to restrict their ability to maximize their political power. But in, you know, a, a neutral, with a veil of ignorance um, as to who would hold power, I think we can all agree that that would be a, a fairer um, system that puts voters in control. And so I think that some of the partisan disputes um, around this are based on who is currently in power. And if we kind of step back and think about what principles our democracy should function on, I think that the For the People Act looks really differently and actually reflects what our constitutional values are and what our values are as a country. Ben? Uh, it was really important for the Rappaport Forum and Harvard Law School to provide this opportunity to, to sort of talk on, on both sides of this issue because as I said, we are really polarized and that happens all too rarely. Uh, I do think there are any number of areas where we could fight the polarization a bit by finding bipartisan agreement, but I think that's not going to occur at all if HR1 is in its current form and brought forward in the Senate on a party line vote as it was in the House. So my deep hope in, in sort of uh, uh, the, the principles of democracy is that uh, we do go forward in a uh, looking for areas of agreement as opposed to getting this jammed through. I hope that we have achieved all of the elements of the Rappaport Forum. Uh, great thanks to our wonderful panelists, Ben Ginsberg, Wendy Weiser. Thank you to the Rappaport Foundation and the, and the Rappaport family. Thank you to HLS and the Dean's Office, Dean Manning, Goldberg, um, Liberty Kennedy, and everybody else who's worked, Ken Kennelly, who's worked to make this uh, a wonderful session. So thank you to all and be well. This ends our forum for this afternoon. <laughs>